buongiorno a tutti chiedo da san di mettermi a togliere la condivisione buongiorno a tutti eccoci per la seconda giornata di summer school um, come vi eh, avevamo detto ieri oggi eh, abbiamo la traduzione in simultanea per cui troverete già attivi eh, in basso uh, nella vostra finestra di zoom eh, i canali di traduzione per cui scegliete it per l'italiano eh, se volete avere la traduzione eh, del um, di quanto detto dai nostri ospiti recording in progress eh, e ehm, inglese se volete sentire in inglese la traduzione dei nostri ospiti italiani non credo che sarà il caso però magari c'è qualche ospite invece è qualche eh, straniero che sta eh, seguendo um, nel caso abbiate problemi di audio uh, nel senso che su, in sottofondo sentirete comunque la base dell'audio originale um, potete rimuovere l'audio originale sempre nell'icona della traduzione disattiva audio originale uh, se uh, disattivate If you disactivate translation, then you can hear the translation in English or in Italian according to the button you choose. I don't know whether I have to remind you of anything else. Um, you, um, Asan, help me if I have to add something. If you don't have the Italian channel uh, active, it means that you haven't updated Zoom, so you have to update Zoom and get in again. The Italian language is only in on version 4. Uh, questions have to be uh, sent um, on the chat. You can book uh, your question if you want to um, speak directly you can um, book your uh, intervention on the chats i don't think i need to say anything else so i'm giving the floor to alicia damiani who is coordinating this session Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, other, uh, the second day of the summer school. My name is Alicia Damiani. I'm part of uh, the association at Sina, and I am going to coordinate this first session. Yesterday, we, we uh, had a look, uh, a critical look um, in terms of the dominating thought and the consequences that it has on mental health and the health of um, drugs users. The session today will be very rich and will have the aim of, uh, um, uh, of uh, having a look at the um, approaches that are parallel to the mainstream. Purpose. Uh, we will talk in particular of harm reduction and recovery. We have various speakers. Everyone will have 20 minutes to speak and there will be room for questions. So the first speaker is Susanna Ronconi. Uh, you all know her. She's a researcher and president of the Scientific Committee of Forum Droga. She will speak about harm reduction. So I will we'll give the floor to Susanna. Thank you, Alice. I would like to ask you when my time has expired, please uh, tell me, let me know. So. I can stick to the time. I'll try and share my uh, screen. 
to show you some of the slides so that we can all follow my speech better. So as Alice was saying, today is a, a, a day for proposals because uh, um, in terms of all the critical issues that we have uh, um, looked at yesterday, today we, can, we are finding out that there is an alternative to the dominating approach and there is an alternative to the criticalities that we have discussed yesterday. As to um, drugs policies, uh, the alternative strategy that we are um, assessing is the harm reduction strategy. I would like to not to say uh, obvious things, um, uh, but rather I would like to present what is the strategic perspective of harm reduction, because we know in Italy especially, and I can assure you that uh, because I have a European look, not only in Italy, but in particular in Italy, we have the difficulty in promoting harm reduction as a, a, a turn of paradigm, a paradigm shift as a policy and not only as a, 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 a set of interventions. So I would like to go through the process in order to understand how harm reduction is a strategic uh, perspective uh, and how it gives us the possibility, it points to the possibility of governing um, the phenomenon of uh, drugs use, illicit drugs use, uh, in ways that, that escape the traps of criminalization and pathologi pathologization. I will also go through the history uh, no doubt harm reduction uh, has a, a birth date and that a push to its birth was given by the AIDS crisis. In the 80s, we can remember the explosion of ADS, AIDS. Uh, there was no effective treatment for AIDS and we can remember that among drugs user, especially injection drugs, um, in that period, we had a number of deaths, which was quite high and therefore AIDS was a real crisis. So no doubt there is a birth date of harm reduction, which has to do with a healthcare problem. What I want to say is that immediately, you will see in these slides, there are some quotation going back to the 90s. Harm reduction was proposed not as an intervention of healthcare um, mode, a healthcare strategy, but rather with an outlook of a, a, a natural a subversion of, of drugs. So what happened at the time was that the hierarchies of objectives of drugs policies were rewritten. So the first uh, provision was the Merseyside, the Liverpool region in England, where uh, the authorities of the region established that the priority at the time was not having a policy, policy of abstinence, but rather taking care of healthcare of drugs users. This has changed the outlook, has changed the objectives, because at the time, we we're talking of mid 80s here, saying that uh, 
drugs policies uh, did not have to prioritize uh, um, uh, the, the uh, drugs policy was not a technical choice, was actually a revolution of policies. And this was the nature, the nature of the uh, harm reduction, which brought together um, the uh, change of outlook on drugs and on drugs users, including an aspect that became more and more strategic. That is the critical, the criticism to the drugs, um, the medical drugs uh, being in the center. Uh, that the fact that they are not controllable, therefore the mainstream thought of the time, and unfortunately also uh, applies today, uh, would uh, um, reject the people from this uh, discourse and make them um, uh, subdued to drugs. So this reversal has put uh, this mainstream outlook into a crisis. So, so it has completely changed the outlook. Now, the scope that for me is strategic and that is which we have to work on is that since that time, we have uh, um, forgotten about the prevalence of the consumption and we have shifted the interest on the models of use. So the number of drugs users was less important and what was more important was the type of models of how these drugs were used, what kind of model of use was adopted. There is a Russell Newcomb uh, quotation here uh, that says the harm reduction is proposing uh, itself is proposing itself as the main policy in terms of drugs, alternative to the one centered on on abstinence. That, on the contrary, it prioritizes the decrease of uh, the spread and uh, um, incidence of uh, drugs use. So the leap, um, which is paradigmatic in my opinion, is strategic, therefore based on a healthcare crisis, there is an approach on drugs which is alternative. And this opens the uh, range of objective, uh, of uh, legitimate objective. Um, so the objectives of quality of healthcare and life of uh, active drugs user. The second uh, political aspect I want to mention is the governance of the phenomenon in the city. How reduction starts in the uh, main European cities and is immediately a way for governing the problems that in the big cities could derive from illicit drugs use. So what is interesting here, I'm not reading the quotation here. Uh, this is from the um, Frankfurt um, meeting of 1990, but the most important interesting thing is the meaning of uh, building bridges policies, uh, policies that want to build bridges in cities, bridges between the people who use drugs and the city and the rest of citizens. And on this, the harm reduction is based on the fact that the uh, zero tolerance approach, the dominating approach, has broken social cohesion in the cities. This is very important. The fact of having decided that uh, human behavior using uh, psychoactive drugs 
had to be under the criminal code has broken, has created some fra fractures in the social uh, bodies, um, making the drugs user deviant, a minority, a deviant minority compared to the rest of the citizens. So there is already an awareness, political awareness of how this a fracture of social cohesion uh, is to be blamed to wrong policies and how harm reduction can have this power of um, uh, bridging the gap. So this is very important. And the second aspect is that with the harm reduction policies, there are the subjects which are the important uh, part, the players. This quotation that uh, I have mentioned from Buning uh, that says the limitation of harm, even if it involves all the system of services, gives a more modest role to the healthcare services, whereas it um, relies more on processes of self-regulation and self-determination of consumers of users. So subjectivity, competence of users becomes a strategic basis um, on which to govern the uses, uh, the drug uses. These are the actors, um, the stakeholders that can support living in our society with a uh, drug drugs use in a sustainable way. Only drugs users can do this before and much better than the uh, policy systems. So harm reduction is a background for the rediscovery of this knowledge, this social competence of the users. I won't talk about this because there's no time, but and that's when the peer support starts, the capacity of creating solidarity networks to ratify the competence, uh, competencies of uh, drugs users, the claiming of rights, because of course this protagonism clashes with the stigmatization and with paradox. Uh, and the harm reduction has quoted this, um, stigmatiza stigmatization is an enemy of this protagonist. Therefore, the struggle to stigma is an important part of this policy. And there is all the reasoning that we all have developed, especially in the last um, decade, on the subject of controlled uh, consumption and self-regulation. Having discovered that drug users are not dominated by the chemistry of substances, but can um, have a control and a regulation, uh, this capacity is actually um, put into the center. And, th and so we also start talking about a functional use of uh, drugs. Uh, drugs can create uh, problems, can cr create risks, have potential risks, but they have some benefits. They are used for some reasons. There is a research on the subjects on this, and this has been the scandal of the harm reduction, uh, pronouncing uh, this word functional use and benefits of the drugs uh, is a scandal that is culturally very meaningful and very important. I cannot go, okay. Okay, the last factor I want to stress is that the setting is a protagonist as well. You can see the uh, photo of Norman Zimberg. Uh, he was important uh, to uh, speak about uh, drug set setting, and he's always claimed that setting uh, from uh, mainstream uh, um, uh, policies was 
uh, left behind, whereas drug set setting makes it rediscover because the setting where drugs are used uh, can be settings that can maximize the harm or minimize the harm. And this is what makes the difference. And there are, of course, um, responsibilities um, of uh, policies. Harm reduction doesn't um, exclude criminalization but it actually owns it because harm reduction knows that mm, criminalization is an important factor and that uh, the impact of criminalization has to be reduced and that's also where the uh, political values of harm reduction lies lays mm. and you can see here a Pat O'Hare quotation that says, since the first and more obvious damage related to the consumption of some drugs is criminalization, the harm reduction strategy um, asks a question. Are the laws launched to contain the harm caused by consumption or do they express a system of dominating values? Of course, it's a rhetorical question, and we know the answer. But this is important because harm reduction does not uh, pretend to um, intervene and in excluding this factor, which is criminalization of drugs users. The last aspect, the importance of uh, social uh, context, social setting as a social learning setting, as a setting of a cultural creation, creating a culture on drugs, on each uh, drug uh, means to uh, acquire what Zimber calls uh, ritual norms of the social settings that help drugs users to use in a sustainable way. And we can draw a parallel with the alcohol, especially in the Mediterranean countries, where it is a substance, but it is also food, um, which is backed by a culture um, that helps everybody to uh, use alcohol in a sustainable way. So harm reduction uh, makes the setting become a, pr a protagonist and gives us another perspective. I am concluding saying that a risk uh, that we run is to medicalize harm reduction, forcing it in the um, uh, healthcare interventions, uh, which are important, of course. So we all know that we all use them and um, propose them, but we must be careful not to lose uh, the uh, aspect of policy um, and, parad and paradigm, of, which is the mo most promising for the future, because we don't believe that future is what UN has uh, indicated, a world without drugs. This is impossible. We know that. So our alternative is a world where drugs use is sustainable. And that is why we want harm reduction as a strategic pro um, proposal. In order to um, uh, to control socially this, uh, the governance, and also uh, to um, eliminate the pathologi pathological um, aspects and criminalization aspects. So using drugs in a sustainable uh, way, um, valorizing subjectivity, favoring social cohesion, and the production of um, uh, culture. So um, this is a nice uh, photo of Karl Hart uh, that I want to conclude with. In his last book, if you have read it, which is called Drug Use for Grown-Ups, finally, uh, Drugs Use for 
adults, where the concept of adults uh, is what we have said so far, competence, control, self-regulation, and so on. Karl Hart is wondering whether we should go from harm reduction to what he calls uh, happiness, healthcare and happiness. He says many of us who are working uh, agree with, uh, with him. It is probably time for emphasizing the um, proactive value of harm reduction that goes from preventing harms to promoting uh, a sustainable use. They're not separated. There's a, a, a continuum between the two aspects, but strategically, I think that being happy, being healthy and being happy, as Karl Hart says, is the true strategic horizon of harm reduction. Thank you for this intervention. Uh, this was very rich and i partecipanti se hanno già qualche domanda la possono scrivere in chat per non perdersela e dopo ci sarà tempo per rispondere quindi dalla riduzione del danno quindi a questo pensiero diverso per chi utilizza sostanze passiamo ora con Ugo Zamburro psichiatra del Dipartimento di Salute Mentale dell'ASL di Torino e soprattutto anche promotore del Caffè Basaglia di Torino a parlare invece di recovery per quanto riguarda quindi la salute mentale. Bene, mi sentite? Sì, sì, prego. Perfetto, allora buongiorno a tutti. Prima mi viene da dire quando Susanna stava parlando dell'ONU che dice che un mondo senza droghe è l'ideale, stavo giusto pensando all'Afghanistan dove da 8.000 ettari sono passati a 23.000 per l'uso, per la coltivazione dell'oppio, comunque va bene. C'è la maglietta qua per ricordarmi che io sono un partigiano, e odio gli indifferenti e quindi questo mio intervento sarà su quella linea passionale, anche perché parlando di psichiatria non stiamo parlando di una scienza, stiamo parlando di ben altra cosa. La parola recovery è una parola inglese con un'accezione molto vasta, tant'è vero che è difficile. Scusami se, scusami se ti interrompo, ti chiedo se puoi, siccome c'è la traduzione simultanea, se puoi parlare un po' più piano, che così certo. diciamo più facile. Grazie, Grazie. sì, sì, chiedo scusa. Allora, la parola recovery è un termine inglese che significa guarigione, ma in un'accezione anche più, più ampia, più vasta che possiamo tradurre anche con qualcosa che significa recupero, ristabilirsi. E è una parola che è molto importante nel campo della salute mentale. Questa è una parola che è molto importante oggi perché si apre qualcosa di diverso, che è un cambiamento culturale, che è necessario. As all the important words, recovery can have different meanings. The system uses the term recovering in the sense of a clinical recovery. So the elimination of symptoms, the improving of the clinical situation and the improving of the social functioning and personal functioning of the person. But this is something which can cause medical and biological problems. And it is focused on drugs and on diagnosis. But we know that from different studies that this is something uh, arbitrary while uh, if we are talking about a diagnosis of internal medicine is the same for everyone in the psychiatric system we found the diagnosis where there are people with stories social functioning 
and personal functioning, which are totally different. The word recovery, as I mean it, and how it is meant in the best meaning, let's say, is linked with different meanings. First of all, the person cannot just be seen as a person with a mental problem because the person has got different identities. So the risk of the treatment, which is done nowadays, it is considering just the part of mental illness. And in a way, let's say, um, switching off the person. So recovery, as I mean it, is something linked to the subjectivity of the person, the way in which I'm living my experience of mental illness, why I am expressing my sufferance through those symptoms. This is the same that Susanna said, referring to the use of drugs. So in this sense, recovery as something individual and something giving value to a personal experience is focused on not on the result, but on the process. So it is a change of perspective where it's not me going to a psychiatrist and saying I need to be treated because in this way, I'm not going to get what I really need. The psychiatrist is saying what is better for you. They just say you have to do this and that. But the important aspect in the recovery, as I mean it, is an active participation of the person in the process and project of recovery and of treatment and to choose the kind of treatment I need. So the right to be informed, to have a dignity to my expectations uh, and to what I really need. One of the best cases is the one of people saying, for example, this drug is causing me those symptoms uh, and the doctor says, but it doesn't matter. At the end, you will feel better. So the other key word is expectation. I have the right hope. Um, I have the right to build a new identity, even through mental illness, and I want to choose it. I don't want to predetermine it in a way. It is something which is also linked to the power and the exchange of knowledge also. Recovery needs a cultural change. First of all, the services for mental internet are not just centers where you can give a medical service focused on, on treatments and on drugs, they have to understand that the approach must be an holistic one. It must be a more complete approach. You have to go back to the territory and people in that context must have the right to be treated and also the operators must be trained in a right way. If you ask to uh, earth operator if schizophrenia can be treated or not 90 percent say that it, it cannot be treated most of them say that drugs must be taken for the rest of your life because they are not well informed they have not the right knowledge so 
uh, they need to have a scientific preparation because we have data, we have books, and we don't understand why this cannot be debated inside the Department of Mental Illness. When I ask the to my mental illness director um, department, can we have a debate on some books? I had read like the one of the white taker. He said it, it cannot be done. Every doctor had to take his or her decision on his own. So there is the idea that we must be the one who decide what it must be uh, done during the treatment. And so that's a real problem because you feel alone when you face those situations and also compare different knowledges is really important. The academic knowledge you can find in books, the knowledge of people, the knowledge of proximity. So our service, which is centered on recovery and uh, on the idea that I don't mind if uh, you have symptoms, I really, mind about you and your um, life story. So uh, this would be totally different. A uh, service focused on recovery, it's centered on reciprocity, and this goes through relation and gives uh, a real meaning to an experience that can be really devastating in a different way. How can a service go in the direction of recovery? It, it's something related to empowerment, empowerment of users and empowerment of operator. When I started working on the Basaya thought it was very important that you go and work in the mental health sector because you felt like a part of movement who, that was going to change the society together with all the rest of stakeholders. Nowadays, in the mental health centers, decisions are based on the fact that people who work there just think about, uh, well, in a few hours and stop working, they are not well trained, everything is totally different. They don't feel as I felt part of a system which was going to change, to really change uh, the society and uh, those kind of problems. There are new techniques, new techniques. Um, there are new tools. The anticipated directive of treatment, you must sit in a table with the person who must be treated and the other important person is life and you talk to them and you have to tell then uh, I think this is what you are going to need in the following month. Maybe we are going to have those results. Maybe we can have those problems with the drugs. I'm going to give you. We can stop and analyze what is happening. Uh, and it is important what you think and what your family think. So it's a totally different approach. You are not saying to a person, this is what you must take, and then we will see. This is a way of starting a real and true relationship, which is important for the person who is going to be treated. And as Ron Coleman said, is uh, uh, an ex-patient, uh, and started the movement of uh, voice hearers. And he said that the most important problem in the mental health center is 
that when you you go there, it's like you you're gonna lose your hope. You feel like there is nothing to do. So this new approach, uh, it's something totally different, and it should be uh, applied in order to change the situation we are living in the mental health center. In 2000, the Tuscan region, thanks to the movement of psychiatric patients who gathered in an association, they succeeded to pass the psychiatric testament will where you state and you say that here there is a person I really trust. Those are my choices. This is what I really prefer. And I want that my choices are going to be respected. In the moment when I'm living an acute crisis, uh, for example, I want that my choice, my desire can be guaranteed by the person who is coming with me. This is what the psychiatric will testament is. It's a person I trust, a person I choose and who is going to share with me this idea. Another important aspect is to use an open dialogue, which is a new way, a new approach for the first crisis, not just psychotic crisis. Where you work on the social network and on listening to everyone. The operator is not fully responsible. They're not going to say this is what is happening and that's the reason why it's happening, but they try to explain the meaning of the symptom you are living in that right moment. And this is defined by all the people together with different uh, approaches, open questions, for example, participation and other important aspects. I can end saying that beyond the studies, which are important, the books, which are important, I wrote a book, a piccolo manuale di sopravvivenza in psichiatria. This is the Italian title, but uh, it's really sad to think that we need a small uh, survival in this field, but we opened a, a Cafe, a Cafe Basaglia in Turin, where some workers were people who were patients before. And what they said was really interesting because they said, we feel better now, even if I can hear voices, but now I have given to those voices a different meaning because it was not important to eliminate the symptoms, but to build a new identity where I could see myself as a, a worker, as a person having some skills that were recognized through a wage. This was the most important part of the therapy for the person itself and all, for all the other people who uh, got to know this experience and so how this person uh, could change his life, could improve his situation, could change also the prejudice referred to the psychiatric mm, disease. So if we work on the stigma, we can create a more um, strong and social effect. And uh, thank you so much, Hugo. Thank you so much. Hugo. It was very much an interesting speech. Uh, recovery is really a fascinating issue. And what you said was really, really interesting. 
troppo già dai primi due interventi, il tuo e quello and di Susanna. With your speech and Susanna's speech, there are a lot of things in common, the use of drugs and the mental health, and you put together how the individual is important and how the symptoms are not important. Harm reduction is important and not just withdrawal, but the meaning uh, of the entire life of the person. So subjectivity is really important. It's important to put the person in the center. I give the floor now to the protagonist of this session, to Valentina Mancuso of Chemical Sisters, who is going to explain what they do, what's their approach, and what they are living. Can you hear me? Grazie mille Alice e grazie mille a tutti so per much, Alice. Per me è veramente un piacere oggi uh, rappresentare un po' quella che è la voce di tutti. It's a pleasure for me today to represent the voice of all the consumer. Uh, it is important uh, to be here and to um, give our vision because our vision is the one that uh, of those who have to face uh, uh, the issues uh, related to health in general uh, and uh, the health of users, the issues of uh, drugs users. One of the main criticism that I would like to do with you is a reasoning on how uh, addiction is uh, seen, is viewed, and how a, an addict is viewed at the social level, but also in the scientific uh, community, um, and how this can uh, lead uh, to um, unpleasant consequences like um, the stereotypes uh, um, on drugs users as it happened also in the psychiatric field um, for people who have uh, special health problems, uh, mental health problems. So one of the main criticism is uh, related to the diagnosis, um, the uh, disease model. So I want to pick up what uh, uh, Dr. Zambura was uh, saying that if with the approach of recovery, hearing voices is not a disease, uh, but an experience um, uh, for those who live, uh, which can be integrated in one's own life, I think that the same can be said uh, for drugs um, use. Uh, the drugs users are not necessarily um, uh, ill but uh, have decided to um, have an experience that can be integrated in one's own life. And it is not impossible that a person with some levels of seriousness of addiction uh, cannot lead a normal life. So the disease model um, hinders this vision this view. In fact, uh, the addiction is uh, seen as uh, um, a disease and uh, uh, the ad addict uh, is seen as a, a, an ill person. And if we look at alcohol addiction, for instance, is quite clear. Mm, it has changed uh, uh, what alcohol um, addiction means. Uh, it has actually come to reflect uh, the uh, logic uh, that um, has uh, taken over in recent times. So there's no satisfactory reply to uh, what it means being an alcoholic and how we can work with alcohol addiction and alcoholics. Uh, when we thought that uh, drinking was a problem, we thought it was good to punish uh, alcoholics. But um, when uh, um, 
drinking alcohol uh, was a disease, uh, um, alcoholics had to be rehabilitated. And the same happens with drug users. So the change in ideology um, has reflected and has reflected itself in the trend that uh, um, we have seen in the areas, in the other areas like medicines, uh, sociology and so on. So this change of paradigm is happening very slowly as far as drugs use is concerned in some parts of the world and not certainly in Italy. So we need to define addiction that goes that starts to destructuralize the sense of uh, addiction uh, intended as illness, uh, as a disease. And we also need uh, addic to define addiction uh, in a way uh, oh, that is different from the models uh, um, which we ref normally refer to. And this is um, also felt in the psychiatric uh, field uh, in the definition of some particular disorders. Now we have to add also the dilemma of the double diagnosis, which confirms how addiction is uh, coming back to be uh, related to uh, psychiatric um, uh, surgeries, it's, uh, it's a very delicate issue. And this leads, uh, actually brings us back into the past when uh, uh, drugs users were closed in uh, a mental health hospital. Uh, luckily, um, the uh, closing of mental health hospitals uh, has revealed how um, these were not a place uh, of uh, therapy, but in fact, they were a detention center. So addiction, again, is confirmed as disease. And if there is a treatment for any uh, disease, uh, the, what follows is that if you are an addict, a drugs addict, then you have to have a, a medication. Unfortunately, today, a lot of institutionalized services work like that. You have to go to the CERT, which is the Italian service. You have to have a treatment. Uh, and hopefully, the uh, medications you have been given uh, uh, can help you to um, stop using uh, um, your drugs, um, not heroin, but uh, yes to amphetamines. Uh, so I'm giving you another substance that as in an institution, I decide that is good for you, what is called a state drugs. And this substance, uh, can create another type of addiction from the uh, service, from the state service, with all the consequences. Uh, Dr. Zampura was um, talking about uh, um, medication-centered uh, uh, policies, which is unfortunately very bad. It's a perspective that um, has only one cause, this perspective was used initially, uh, as we said, um, for alcohol use when the behavior uh, became uh, a disease and not simply a vice. Uh, one of the first scholar, scholars uh, who tried to change this approach was Osbell, a US uh, psychologist who in one of his writings, uh, said, um, mentioned a multi-factor um, model. Uh, he was um, defining the various types of uh, addictions, and there are many causes for this disorder. Therefore, the solution cannot be one directional. And this is um, connected to the psychiatric field where 
priority is to um, eliminate the symptoms without even understanding the causes. So what I also would like to stress is how the exist the absence, uh, the lack of uh, support from the services is really felt, strongly felt. Therapy cannot be the only instrument, but must always be support, psychological, social support, so that uh, uh, so as to allow um, people to live in a protected environment with a reality of subject that can stimulate the people um, to create um, a, a healthy um, setting. So this lack of support from the services was found in the peer support and in the various networks of drugs users that have um, been organizing uh, over the years, like the uh, experience of uh, Flusso in Torino or Haran, uh, Chemical Sisters and so on. So the involvement of um, peers uh, it's an important empowerment instrument and we would like it to be more used within the services. We have some Italian exception, some network of um, users that collaborate with the state uh, institutions, but they are exceptions which are um, due to the um, activists that are uh, present in Piemonte, for instance, in the north of Italy. So the peers can uh, play an important role and we would like this role to be played not only in terms of prevention, in the promotion of health care, um, in the harm reduction, but also in the therapy and scientific research. And the work by Coleman uh, shows how this is uh, possible. Neglecting the peers and ignoring what their capacities are during uh, the formulation of a project is uh, like making them instrumental. So the importance of uh, peer uh, networks uh, in all the fields, in whatever field, is also used uh, to be uh, represented, uh, to be understood, not to feel lonely. And this is very important in order to enable people to accept themselves, to accept this part of themselves without any shame, any uh, need for hiding. Susanna was uh, speaking about uh, Karl Hart. People like Karl Hart, like Coleman, uh, um, have made a difference because not only they are recognized by the scientific communities, but they had the possibility and the will to to uh, come out as uh, uh, consumers and not as uh, any consumer, but as a heroin consumer, which is one of the um, delicate subjects. And this is not possible for everyone. There are still some people who have to hide. Um, so this is certainly one of the main obstacles that we have to um, eliminate, to work for eliminating. I hope I have given you some uh, hints and this is uh, the end of my intervention. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you also for um, your reflections. I would like to stress how uh, important is uh, the people. Um, and as it was already mentioned, how uh, is the person uh, who knows what is good for oneself? Certainly professionals uh, of, uh, have, of course, more uh, important information, but whatever therapy, whatever intervention, 
must be adapted uh, to the specific uh, features of the person. Thank you for your uh, intervention. And I'm now giving the floor to Rui Corimbra Morales um, of the International. Hello, do you hear me? Thank you. La traduzione, quindi invito tutti i partecipanti che ne hanno bisogno a cliccare su it di italiano. Grazie, prego. Uh, can I share? Yeah, uh, it's my, uh, it's, sì, it's my PowerPoint uh, visible? Sì. So, well, uh, first, uh, uh, I'd like to thank you for this invitation of Forum Belgi to, to uh, be able to participate in this uh, uh, kind of event that I feel that uh, it's um, uh, an honor and, and, and to have this engagement of uh, people that use drugs uh, uh, more uh, like like uh, Valentina was saying, appearing more and so on, it is uh, uh, um, very important. Um, yeah, my name is Rui. I'm the president of the producer union in Portugal, and uh, uh, I work in the uh, the European network of people who use drugs, uh, representing Portugal and also in the executive. And this has been uh, a path very important for me. My background is on psychology. I'm a specialist in health and clinics and advanced specialty in community psychology. Uh, I, I worked in a health center for uh, users. So I, I am, but for the last 10 years, I'm working on the on, on community and on the field. So, um, yeah, so I, I always work with uh, with these uh, fringes and these these enfranchised public. So uh, when this challenge was uh, uh, done to me by Susanna, I, I, I began by thinking on the idea of health and how uh, on uh, some some few centuries things have. have uh, uh, changed so much since the Renaissance uh, uh, with uh, the idea of uh, uh, the, the reason that uh, is, uh, is able to control and is able to overcome nature and uh, so its developments uh, until 18th century and 19th century with this kind of uh, 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 I, a very, very well designed uh, uh, pillars like uh, the nation states appearing, uh, the, the market, the people, uh, how this, uh, this uh, uh, well distributed and rational scheme, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, the ideal uh, promise of a, an ideal, idealized world. Uh, and um, so you, we can see uh, uh, that, for instance, in uh, the beginning of the century, there was no, no problematic use as we know it. There was uh, uh, problematic users, usually people that uh, were uh, uh, you know, using uh, by prescription, by doctor, but uh, with the, the, the temperance movements in the United States and uh, with this uh, campaign for moralizing society in 20 years, so in the first 20 years of, uh, of the century, uh, the, the profile of drug user changed uh, and it was uh, a criminal and it was so in the in the versailles treaty uh, this is just a curiosity but in the versailles treaty of uh, the ending of the first uh, world war there there are in the in an article the 23rd article where 
uh, in, in small letters, people, all nations have signed that they were against uh, uh, the, the com commercialization of uh, opium and uh, other dangerous drugs. Um, this idea of health has come from uh, uh, a thing that was outside our bodies. Uh, and with, uh, with the opportunity of uh, uh, pathology and uh, opening bodies and this uh, 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 clinical medicine, uh, scientific medicine, uh, the, 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 you know, you lose the smell and the, the touch that were the principal means of diagnosis and you change to, to the vision and you change to the symptoms and, and, and then you exclude from society a group of people and, uh, and uh, create this kind of systematic uh, uh, gathering and collection of information that, that uh, then with uh, this, uh, this uh, idea of rationality and this idea of ideal taxonomies bring also from botanics, you know, we have uh, then the, 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 the no, no graphic uh, entities of uh, disease. Disease uh, is created, disease inside the, 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 the organism. And um, uh, so, so I, I'd like to change something here because uh, there are other ways where, where, uh, where, uh, health is can be seen so um Kangilam, there's this, it is another uh, uh, philosopher and medical doctor he says that uh, uh, life uh, health is the, the the life flowing in the silence of organs uh, so it's it's from another uh, uh, order uh, uh, different from health in itself it's not a, a difference in health. It's not a difference in the quality of your health, but it's a new order that emerges. It's a difference. And it's this part that I wanted to, to, to reach, that uh, uh, we are uh, uh, healing difference. We don't support difference. We, uh, and, and difference, both in biology, uh, different brains, schizophrenia, autism, uh, difference uh, should be cared and difference can bring uh, uh, you know, the, the, the other, uh, other meanings and other kinds of uh, alternative ways of uh, uh, looking at, uh, at uh, all this. So um, I, I I see these kind of differences when I look at chemical scissors or where, when I look at uh, uh, you know community-based organizations that uh, try to to you know uh, get back their own voice, get back their own voice, and and uh, uh, let us say because most uh, legislation and these frameworks that uh, uh, you know configure the prohibitionism uh, it's everywhere even Portugal that has decriminalization but uh, stigma didn't disappear and uh, there's uh, this kind of uh, uh, overcome of the we still have the stigma of uh, criminals and bad character and lack of will and now we are also sick people it's uh, we, we have to change for the, the good Good health and uh, well-being, uh, you know, maximize pleasures, maximize benefits, if you wish, and not even arm reduction. Now, for me, it's already uh, the questions of language. It's already uh, something that is negative, and I think that uh, uh, drugs and altered states of conscience doesn't have to be uh, 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 seen like. So we have seen that drugs uh, were connected to uh, just an elite, and of course, with 
democratization of societies and globalization uh, made, the, made the rest in terms of uh, uh, a use of drugs that is not coded, that is not uh, uh, framed in some you know, mystical uh, approach or medicine approach. Um, so so uh, another thing I, I'd like to to highlight is uh, is uh, things like uh, the, the the manual of, uh, of diagnosis of uh, diseases you know diseases that appear then diseases that disappear it's not a, a scientific basis it's a consensus basis manual and uh, so you you can see over the years uh, uh, diseases disappearing like uh, homosexuality and then other things appearing like uh, you know, addiction to sex or addiction to uh, so and uh, we are at risk again of the, the brain damage uh, model to come back with this uh, idea of the center of reward in the brain that is different of course it's different uh, but if you go to see the brains of the, the taxi drivers of London, they have uh, uh, a part of the brain that uh, is more uh, with more cells, you know, that, and you don't call it the taxi driver disease. Having a difference in the brain, having a difference in the way you live, in your lifestyle, that should not be uh, a thing uh, immediately for exclusion and labeling and it should be a thing to be cared about and to be looked uh, uh, and to be supported in most cases. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm almost finishing. This is uh, an idea that I uh, took from a, 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 an influencer uh, uh, from YouTube, and we was talking about the less. Uh, this is because of the strategies. Because I, I was thinking when Susanna invited me well this is uh, when i looked at the names of the peoples and services and this is a, a meeting where all these people can and is doing the change but uh, it seems that uh, we are always a, a, a little bit late to change the paradigm at least for users and so uh, the, what uh, what the less says is that uh, we, we maybe we are losing too much time in this uh, um, uh, fights about ideology and about uh, you know in in a, in a party almost party political level and uh, uh, we should find this kind of flight lines these lines of liberty these lines that sometimes uh, 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 and uh, overcome this uh, framed already uh, language, this framed uh, look that we have uh, on society. Um, and maybe the, the, the strategies and uh, I think on a, a kind of, uh, you know, I think there's a good knowledge, uh, a good epistemic knowledge from the left, of course. And, and I think that there, with the humanistic approach, this kind of thinking about solidarity and uh, uh, that uh, traditional left uh, has, uh, have to have a bigger impact on, uh, on uh, how we see and how we live with one another. And to see lots of people like me that uh, uh, have not the same luck that I had and uh, because of stigma, uh, all the, their, their lives uh, is, uh, you know, changed and so on. So how can this uh, be seen without social determinants? How can this uh, uh, poor people be chased, you know, because of being, uh, being put out of uh, social housing because of using drugs and even being put in prison? Because of using drugs, but in Portugal there are still people that go to prison because of using, not because of, uh, of, tra of trafficking. You know, in, in 2017 there was 723 people that were accused of using too much. If you use too much in a decriminalized model, you should be uh, sick too much. So you, you should be um, 
needing more help. And again, 20 years later, we, we have the same debate, you know. Um, uh, yeah, and so it's, it's uh, reaching almost the end, the, the idea that uh, power is a, a very uh, fluid uh, uh, relation, relation and reciprocal, like uh, I heard, uh, way of, uh, of uh, society to, to self-control this idea that uh, uh, control societies, uh, algorithms and so on uh, uh, will, will, will limit your future scenarios. So things are, are running so fast on, on this uh, area of controlling that I feel that our you know, human time is not enough to, to stop what's happening. Uh, yeah, so just to end, and then I will be. Uh, this is uh, 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 you know, an illness that was uh, all built up uh, mostly upon uh, lies and upon uh, bad evidence and moralism. And uh, I, I'm, I'm Every every day I feel you know kind of uh, ashamed of this uh, uh, you know Western society where we have good knowledge but still we have this decisions and deciders that uh, uh, will be deciding uh, thinking on the voting and, and on the election they will have uh, next day and this is very uh, uh, hard to see and we see this in. Uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, we see this populism uh, kind of spreading. And again, this uh, I feel uh, uh, it's not good for minorities. It's not uh, so. I feel a little bit uh, uh, scared that uh, we uh, go back to this kind of uh, um, disciplinarian punishment uh, kind of society, but. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I, 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 the, the, the big idea I wish to, to, to tell is that uh, we should uh, uh, all, it's, uh, disease is not a disease just of the subject, it's a, a disease of us all, of us all as a society. And uh, so uh, leaving no one behind, leaving no one outside, and caring for uh, caring for the difference, uh, and I would stop uh, here and then able to answer questions. Thank you. Grazie mille di questo bellissimo intervento. Thank you. Thank you for having given voice to people who use drugs in Europe. Uh, and again, the reflection on the power uh, dynamic when uh, you were saying who is determining the limit uh, to define whether the excess, there is an excess use, excessive use or not. Uh, during the question time, we'll uh, talk about that. So thank you to Valentina and uh, Rui who have uh, given voice to drugs users. Now we give the voice to those who will um, uh, deal with the health, uh, mental health you, um, issues. Uh, Martin Cole will have the floor uh, who deals with the hearing voices. Uh, he's from a recovery college from Utrecht. Thank you. Thank you for having me here uh, at your summer school. And I'm still digesting what uh, I've heard uh, from the, the previous uh, speakers. It was really touching and also um, it fits really into my story, the story I want to uh, share. And I was uh, curious about uh, what would uh, the, those hardliners of the medical model uh, think of your story. Um, I, 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 I wish they were here and we could have a debate uh, because I'm, I'm sometimes a bit scared that we live in parallel dimensions uh, 
the dimension uh, of, of 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 us and uh, them and 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 it seems sometimes that that those worlds are uh, so apart um i want to share uh, some some slides um and uh, alice uh, help me uh, to uh, safeguard time uh, because um um yeah uh, i have limited time and maybe too much to tell um okay um let's see uh, how can i um oh wait a minute i want to I can't. Um... Maybe on the bottom you got a small sign, the bottom of PowerPoint. Yeah. To start on the right bottom. Yeah, yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't respond. Wait a minute. I will I'm close sorry. it. I will close it. Wait a minute. Uh... In any case, we, we can see it huh? and we can read. Yeah, but I can't control the PowerPoint. It is uh, jammed, or uh, um, so I have to reboot it. I think. Wait a minute. Uh, let's see what. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I say just one more thing that I didn't say? Yeah, that's the edge. Okay, yes. well, while we're waiting, I, I was uh, thinking on uh, Valentina and the peer workers as a kind of uh, possible archetype for, for uh, democratic participation, because it's very horizontal, it's very uh, personal and relation. Okay. Uh, are you ready, Martin? Yes. Um, uh, so... I am uh, Martin Kola, and I will try to uh, talk about the importance of uh, peer support and peer support environments and why we so badly need those places. And I think it, it really uh, brings together what is, is told by the previous uh, speakers. So I'm very happy with those stories uh, that have been shared. Um, but Okay, I hope. Oh, wait a minute. I am Martin Kohler and I am uh, a person with a lot of lived experience within mental health service. And um, I am also a uh, founder of ANIC Recovery College together with Tom Verspoor. And Tom Verspoor, uh, my mate, uh, he has uh, a lot of experience with. Uh, serious drugs uh, abuse or, or how do you want to call it and interesting thing is that when we share our stories there are a lot of similarities not on the type of drugs we use because i i used psychiatric drugs and he used all kinds of other drugs but when we start to explore our stories there are many similarities on the human level on, on, on the level of, of what we experienced in our childhood, what we experienced in our teenage years and adulthood, and especially also what had happened with our identity and our idea of who we were and who we are. So there is no problem in combining those worlds. And I think it is very important to combine those worlds and uh, uh, and I am uh, also an open dialogue facilitator and an open dialogue teacher. And that was also mentioned uh, by Hugo. And uh, uh, open dialogue is one of the promising approaches, in my opinion. I'm from Utrecht, a small city in, in, in a small country of the Netherlands. Most of you will know it. Uh, and uh, uh, we started with one big recovery college and now 
we have uh, five at uh, five six recovery colleges, some small, some big, and we will also uh, expand to the uh, neighboring cities, uh, Seist and Wood. So we will expand with two more, at least two more next year. And we started with uh, ANIC Recovery College, a 2000 square meter recovery college. Uh, you see here an aerial picture from Google, and it is a 100% peer run center. So 2000 square meters, uh, totally controlled and uh, uh, in charge by peers. And that is uh, quite uh, a trend. Uh, a, a, a breach with the current trends where everything is controlled by mental health care workers and uh, uh, i want to to emphasize and, and 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 recovery and empowerment was already mentioned that when we want to understand this why peer support is so important we have to understand what recovery and empowerment is about and uh, so that's what I always try to start with, that the, the paradigm that shifts was also already mentioned by several of my previous uh, speakers, uh, is about a change in perspective, a change uh, uh, in, 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 in frame, a change in, uh, in narrative. And uh, it is uh, uh, shown in this picture by to the left, Charcot, a psychiatrist and a researcher who is explaining what a, a woman with hysteria uh, uh, experienced uh, in the late 80s uh, uh, of the 19th century. And to the right, a person with lived experience who is uh, presenting her recovery story. And that is a fundamental change in perspective. Instead of being told, about or being used as an example uh, uh, towards being a human being, a unique human being, and being able to present your own story, your own narrative. And so from being at, 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 an, an, an objective to a subjective, like, like Rui told. And, and I think this is, this is not just a nice thing. This is uh, really disrupting our current way of thinking and also how we want to uh, 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 develop and, 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 and uh, create services. Uh, uh, and Rui also said, okay, we want to have more impact in the services. And I think when you uh, uh, invite that different perspective, that unique personal perspective, you will see that the current services will be uh, under stress because they will be changed deeply, profoundly. And it will be uh, 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 done by, by rea realizing that recovery, it is also already mentioned, is not about just a chemical or a biological change or a deviance. It is about a legitimate human experiences. It is about the legitimate human experience of having mental health challenges or uh, 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 challenges while you use uh, drugs. Um, so uh, it is not about uh, it is more about uh, uh, what happens when you face such challenges that your life and your idea of sense of self is, 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 is under a, a huge stress, or maybe you live uh, or you have lived in, 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 in severe, difficult situations and uh, uh, how uh, your relationship to society is, 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 is damaged. And your idea and your identity is also uh, uh, damaged. And so people have to recover of much more than just using drugs or using, don't using drugs or having a mental health issue or having, having not a mental health issue. It is about how you relate to yourself 
and how you relate to society. And do you think there is a part in for you in society and, and how can I uh, 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 recover from being uh, dis, uh, uh, disconnected? And, and uh, especially when there is a lot of pain and a lot of stress and a lot of suffering, not only with people who use men, uh, uh, drugs, but also with their environment, you see a lot of uh, exclusion. You see that 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 society tries to 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 disconnect and say, okay, you have a problem, and we will take care of it by sending you to a, a, a service, or we will, uh, uh, but also by users themselves. Uh, whether they use psychiatric drugs or having a mental health issue or uh, drugs addiction, uh, we also tend to disconnect because we can't face the, our feelings of, of, of shame, our feelings of, 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 of loss of sense of self, our, 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 our pain. Uh, and, and society can be a sort of a mirror of our failure or our idea that we fail. So we, we, we retreat into our best known world, whether it is mental health service or whether it is a, du- a drugs scene, both are well known for, and, and, and we are not, 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 not mirrored constantly with, 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 with the world we are not part of, or we don't feel part of. And this is a really, serious issue and not uh, well addressed by regular services. Uh, So the personal dimension, the dimension of do I feel part of society and am I, can I be the person I want and am I able to find a place in society where I have a reciprocal uh, useful uh, uh, a valuable role uh, 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 instead of being just a one identity, a user of mental health service or a one identity, a drugs a user. Uh, when we stick to the one dimension, we will never, never, never reach recovery because it is too simple and too um, uh, uh, limited. So, um, and I think that that with the process of recovery, there is a lot of tension involved. And I, I, I had this picture, and I, we have not a lot of time because there is a world behind this picture, but this picture is about the space we, 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 we want to take, the space for empowerment, the space for, for recovery. And what we see is when there is a lot of suffering, we tend to retreat and to 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 retreat into a smaller space, and our environment will will dominate will dominate because they they want to solve the suffering, they want to solve the pain, they want to solve the problem, and they will uh, inject their values. They will inject their meaning and their. Their, their, their ideas of what is the problem and, and, and what is the meaning of, of, of this situation and this story. And when people want to uh, 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 recover, they want to take space and they want to make meaning and they want to have an active, an active position, an active stance instead of a passive recipient stance. So they want to take space and that immediately will bring counter pressures from society. So uh, when people want to recover, we have to understand and reflect on how do we relate as an environment to the taking space of a person uh, 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 and his, 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 his ideas of trying to recover that will bring tension with its environment. And we have to reflect on that because with a lot of tension in a social context or within the services or within uh, the users that, that, that you're part of, there are dangers. So uh, that people will lose their human rights because the tension 
have to be resolved so our environment will press on uh, uh, the rights. Uh, uh, there will be coercion and forced treatment or people uh, have to be disempowered or the, there will be a problem focused uh, stance or uh, people will be given a choice you have either to cooperate or we will not give you access to treatment or services. And sometimes when the pressures are too big, people will avoid service uh, and will rather sleep below the bridge uh, 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 than to go to a mental health service or an addiction service because they feel not the space they can uh, uh, need, they need to be. So uh, 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 ANIC is based on that principle uh, a recovery college where there is space. Space for human beings to breathe. Space to make meaning, to give meaning to your story. To be a participant, a student, or someone who is facilitating self-help groups. And not just a recipient of care. We are all equal. So either you are a facilitator and a participant, we are all equal, there is no hierarchy. We create our own recovery journey by choosing our own way in our program. So there's not a fixed program. And, and maybe uh, uh, most important is you start to relate to each other in a reciprocal equal way. So friendships may start, relationships may start, and, and, and you will not end a course with being discharged, so like in services, but you end the course with a certificate. And at ANIC, uh, people uh, uh, will try to gain more autonomy and agency. And agency uh, 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 is difficult because it will immediately have a reaction from the society and outside world and empowerment and social inclusion. And, 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 and uh, uh, it was also mentioned diversity, diversity, not uh, people are accepted and acknowledged in all its diversity because we are not owner of someone else's story or someone else's meaning. We, we are just human beings and what we experience and also what 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 we face in life uh, uh, can be very difficult, uh, uh, but we we can't own someone else. Uh, the the meaning making is 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 the ownership is the person himself or herself. So everyone is welcome. If this, there is no even when you are still an active user of drugs, no problem. Uh, 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 and we, we, we have a clear framework to protect that space. And this is important. You have to understand the concept of recovery, empowerment, and peer support to build a community like this uh, to maintain the space. And we normalize behavior in a sense that all behavior has meaning. And, and, and so don't judge and try to uh, uh, accept uh, that, you, that, that you maybe not understand behavior the, uh, instantly, but you have to be curious what is the, the meaning of some behavior. And we, we do no medical language. So we are just a public surface, a public environment of peers who want to deconstruct stigma, deconstruct stigma society, but maybe more, most of all, deconstruct the self-stigma. And uh, uh, this picture I, I, I always use, uh, and I want to, 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 to complete my, my presentation with this story. Are you the driver or the passenger in your life? I think I've locked myself in the boot. Many of us have locked ourselves in the boot, and we invite people to take place behind their on steering wheel and face the challenges, face the challenges they have to face in life. And, and to conclude, 
facing challenges in life is also about facing the pain, the shame, the, the, the struggle. Uh, uh, recovery is as much as facing pain and, and, and struggle and, 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 and challenges than that you have a sort of a ideal happy life because we will not have an ideal happy life. We will also have pain, loss and sorrow. And Enik is as much a place for pain, loss and sorrow as it is a place of hope and perspective. Thank you very much. Grazie mille a te di questa bellissima presentazione e di aver condiviso con noi questa esperienza. Thank you for this uh, um, wonderful uh, presentation. I think that this touches um, all, um, all the subjects that have come out, the peer support, the empowerment, the importance of community and how this type of a new type of society of community must look with different eyes at these people in order to give them uh, subjectivity and importance to each one. Thank you very much. Now I'll give the floor to Paul Baker from the International Mental Health Collaborating Network. He's one of the uh, main protagonists of the um, hearing uh, voice hearing hearers movement. Thank you, Lichi. Uh, yeah, uh, so much to talk about and so little time. Um, I, 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 I want to start with, uh, I'm going to put some little uh, messages in the chat, which you, we, be, you'll be able to see. But the first thing I want to talk about really was um, switching the debate around the other way, which is an important starting point. In my country, in the United Kingdom, six million adults are currently taking antidepressants. That's a psychoactive substance that's, that's provided to a large part of the adult population. That's massive. Um, meanwhile, that doesn't even take into account anti-anxiety medication or the other medications, the psychoactive substances that are provided by psychiatry to the general population. You know, it's, it, this, this is enormous. I mean, we have, we have to understand that we are, in effect, a medicated society. We, we go to psychoactive substances to find, to make differences in the way that we feel. We all do that. In fact, actually, Italy probably is largely to blame for this. Because you created a caffeinated society. The caffeinated society means that we, we take this nuanced drug in our system that if we stop taking it within three days, we feel awful. And it, you know, it started, I mean, it didn't start in Italy, but, you know, Segafredo and Lavazza and all these, and, and even in Trieste, you have, uh, you have the famous um, uh, coffee company. So I, I think we need to understand all of us in this room today, we are all of us probably at some level uh, a, a drug taker of some kind. I would be very surprised if the profile of this group is any different from any other group that I would be part of, including the group that I've just left, which is the Intervoice Congress, which is taking part place at this very moment. But I felt it's important to reach out and to share the learning from our community. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm talking now about the people who have not yet met Martin and have not yet had the opportunities to go into these kind of environments of peer support. What is the messaging that you get? What is the messaging that you get? In my, okay, this is my city. I live in Manchester. I'm living in a, in, in, in a, what used to be a large council municipal housing estate. I walk to my local park and I will find silver capsules on the floor because people, the, the young people, when I was young, I would drink some alcohol at the bus station, at the bus stop. Now they go to uh, what they call hippie crack. They're going to nitrous oxide, NOS, they call it. So you know, this is 15, 16 year old kids, you know. Um, meanwhile, we have an elaborate infrastructure for selling cannabis in my city. It used to be the day when we were probably young that it was all coming from Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia. Not now. Now it's grown in grow houses. Maybe, you know, I could smell them, you know, just down the street from where I live. You can get cannabis in my city faster than a pizza. They have loyalty cards. They have, they have a system to, to encourage you. Meanwhile, they're hybridizing the cannabis to create much higher levels of THC. Okay. 
basically the police have given up uh, that you can walk around my city and you'll smell the sweet smell of marijuana everywhere, just about everywhere. It's 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 a constant. OK, meanwhile, um, some people can't afford the cannabis. So what do they do? There's another street drug around in, our, in, my, in my city called Spice. It's aimed at homeless people who have no money. So this is a very flexible market. Now, the people who, now I know these guys who are selling this stuff. You know, I know, I know, I know the mid-level dealers who are dealing in kilos of, of cannabis, okay? And then they, they're sharing it out. There's two things going on here. One of which is um, these are young social, these are, these are entrepreneurs. But because they never had the opportunity to get into formal education, they are using their, their smarts, their skills, their knowledge to create a, to create a business. Now, the problem with the business is, is that the business is illegal. And because if it's illegal, if you've got a lot of cash, you're vulnerable to criminals. And criminals will come take your money. They'll come take your cannabis. So we have these high levels in certain communities, in the inner city communities of my, of my where they are selling the cannabis, where the people basically in return for being able to feed their own need for the cannabis or whatever it is. I'm not saying it's just cannabis they will sell it on the street, but they're not making any money really more than to feed their own, their own needs. So it's a sophisticated marketing system. And who are they selling it to? This is the irony. They're selling it to the 60,000 students who come into the city every year to, to come to the big prestigious universities that we have in here. So the market economy is based on the young, poor people who are trying to make money for themselves. Some of them on a business model basis, who are trying, who are selling to the privileged and to the educated. We are all involved in this. This is the key, I think. So when I, when I look at this, I look at the contradictions. So my, I have a friend uh, I, who I work with, he's a member of my men's group. His name is Chaz. He is hearing voices. He does not see and does not want to take the medication that's offered to him by, by psychiatry, which is very powerful. It's antipsychotic. It does massive things to you. You take this medication, it will reduce your life by 20 years. No, do not, you know, if you've got a choice, don't take it. But a lot of people, that's the go-to. That's where people are sent. Now, so he is, he, he, but he has no choice over taking this medication because under law, if he doesn't take this medication, they will come and take him back into hospital and force him to take this medication because of his diagnosis and because of the, of the legal situation that he finds himself, because they understand him to be a risk to himself and possibly to other people. So he must be on this medication because he's deluded. He hears voices and he has an explanation of the world which is outside of the norm, you know, so he, he's, he's vulnerable. Meanwhile, his go-to is cannabis, but he's not prepared to give up the cannabis. And so he ends up taking the cannabis and he takes the, the antipsychotic medication. This is, a, this is a really problematic thing. Now, generally, what's happened is, is every six, eight, eight months, and they pull him back into hospital because he refused to go to the clinic to take his medication. So that's, he's in breach of his psychiatric order. So they take him back into hospital, and they rapidly tranquilize him, and they force him to take a depot medication injection, which will last for a month, a long-lasting uh, medication and I always ask myself the question here who is the pusher who is the pusher in this circumstance this is very I may be a very 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 sort of a strong statement to make but I actually see in some respects the medical system paralleling the street-based system except for one thing they have the law so they can force you to take the medication so this could so the question I suppose we start with is 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 really how how you know I've not even talked about opi opioids. The other thing that's going on in Manchester is people are buying these stuff on, on the net, dark net usually, and they're buying opioids from China. They're buying, they're buying, you know, they're buying all sorts of things. For instance, benzodiazepine is very popular right now. So you've got things going on, two kinds of drugs. People are taking drugs to get out of the state, like spice. So I can literally have three hours on the floor, not giving a shit anymore about what's going on with me, escaping for the issues for a little while in your life. Um, but on the other hand, 
in terms of psychiatric medication, if you, tr you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very um, mixed message agenda that is received by, by anybody who, who's um, in the situation. I remember, for you, I'll give you why, a reason why. In Trieste, a very progressive mental health service, which we like, you know, it really talks a lot about citizenship. But what they were doing in Trieste, I don't know if they still do it, but people were having their uh, antipsychotic medication topped up with diazepam, with, with benzodiazepam, and people had their own little bottles so they could drop, drop, drop. So people were given by um, the psychiatric service a medication that's known to be highly addictive highly addictive and it should only be given for four to six weeks and they were these people are on it for life this is this was the go-to so we we have a real issue here about how we understand mind altering substances in relationship to whether or not they are necessarily um you know uh, uh, in some way uh useful or valuable for the person you know the term would be self-medication um a lot of people i know hear voices do go to things like cannabis and alcohol and other med, med, you know, other things to self-medicate to just bring down that, that energy sometimes. Um, the problem is, of course, is that we know that um, a lot of these issues are very um, difficult to understand. So if we put, I think what we're saying is it doesn't really matter what the psychoactive drug is, be it, be it prescribed or from the street, effectively it changes what goes on inside your mind. How you experience what goes on in your mind, we feel, we understand it's very subjective. Some people benefit from antipsychotics, other people, it's a disaster. But we also know whatever that, whatever that substance you put in your body, it can have an impact on your physical body. It may lead you to, if you're smoking tobacco with cannabis, it can affect you get lung problems. So it has all sorts of associated issues. If you take crack on the street and you're lying on the floor, you are vulnerable to attack. You know, there's all sorts of issues. So, I mean, I, I go back to, I've been in this business for quite a few years. Um, I'm, I'm now in my 60s. In the 1980s, we tried a new project. Um, we were working with people who, in this context, were, were drinking what they call crude spirit. They were drinking alcohol but alcohol that's from uh you know like like not intended for consumption for public consumption because it was the cheapest thing they could find now what we understood when we went and worked with that group who were living on the street we understood there was a process of induction when you people would come out of prison rejoin the group but you couldn't drink the alcohol like that but it would kill you so they had a process of induction the people would gently sip it and get into it they shared their money Anybody who got their, 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 their government money or for their pension or their, or their, they would share it, pull it with the others so they could buy the alcohol. That was the premise. Everybody we, we, were, we, we talked to about this group says the only way that they can be moved into housing is if they recognize they have a problem and that they are addicted because they must reach the bottom before they can move up. Bottom for these guys is death. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no other alternative. It's, it's going to kill you um, in the end. So what we did is we said, okay, let's do a housing first proposition. We have no expectations of you changing your behaviour. You just will have somewhere very nice to live that's not on the street where you've got your own key to your own door. Within six months, that group had started to break up, and people because they had their own locked door and choices about how they use their own money. People moved on to beverage alcohol. They moved on to cider and on to wine, et cetera, et cetera. And we realized that if you fundamentally address the issues which are toxic in people's lives, the people who are on the street were drinking this because it was the only way they could survive on the street. So this takes us to, to, the, to, 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 the, to the social determinant agenda. And this is for me is that this is driven not by personal um, and, and problematic issues to do with our failings as individuals and our addictive, disease-prone brains, but more it's to do with the way that our economy and our society is set up. It's no surprise that it's the poor people of Manchester who are selling this stuff, and it's no surprise that the people who are profiting from this stuff are the rich. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it, it, it plays entirely into that kind of big socioeconomic Drive. And that's why we need to move towards an understanding that 
if people are going to be supported to to as we say to to be part of a an understanding that whatever we are putting in our bodies it's has to be normalized but we also have to pay attention to the public health agenda which i think everybody is as understanding um so you know it, it's it's there's so many contradictions uh, and i keep, and i'm pointing those out today you know for instance the psychiatric hospital in my in my city they now pat you down when you come in they sort of do a search on you like going into prison because they're so scared about the amount of cannabis and other drugs that are being brought into the psychiatric hospital because people are using their phones to get their people to either throw it over the fence or, you know, so they, they, you know, this, we have to, I think, sort of step back from this and say, whoa, you know, whatever's going on here, we need a root and branch kind of review of understanding this and, and having a recognition that what is happening on the streets is in no way being acknowledged or recognised by the services, and we need really to to understand: are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? Uh, I have no idea, Alice, if I've gone on for twenty minutes or not, or how long I've got left. So, how long have I got? No, mancano altri cinque minuti. Se vuoi intanto viaggiare. You have five minutes more. Five, five minutes more. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I want to now reflect on you know a little bit more about the hearing voices movement and 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 intervoice uh, and the way that we understand and I think this is critical to this kind of forum that we have here. Over the last thirty years, we've grown this hearing voices movement, but we've done it by acknowledging as workers and as peers that we need to speak our truth. So I would have to tell you, hey, I smoke marijuana. You know, um, I do. If I come across it, I smoke it. You know, so. In some respects, therefore, I, I kind of connect, and I, I would be very surprised again if I'm the only person in the room that's ever done that. It's it's about acknowledging. Sometimes we, you know, we we construct our relationships between the the intervener. You know, we do things to people. It's very much like Martin showed you, where with the with the uh, you know that we talk about the person rather than with the person, or we switch the issue around. And a lot of that is about us reaching in and talking about our own emotional issues, about things that we do for ourselves as individuals, as workers, to, to, you know, to, to help deal with our own issues in our lives. And this is, this is part of the kind of new honesty, which I think is the glue which holds the Hearing Voices movement together, that when you walk into that space, you genuinely feel like you're a peer, even if you're a psychiatrist. Because you are, you are asked, you're being asked to reach into your own truth and your own understanding. So, you know, a lot of us may well be that we're in the drugs business because this is a personal demon for us. Who knows? Maybe we know somebody close in our family that's been dealing with this. Or maybe it's an issue for us that we're, you know, and it could be caffeine. Who knows? Uh, I mean, I just had a massive cup this morning. So, so in, in, in a sense, I think uh, what I'm trying to reach to is, is a re-examination of the very human connection about what we're talking about really is creating community. And somebody said to me um, yesterday at the Hearing Voices Congress is that what we're trying to do is create new kind of communities outside of the, of the mainstream cultural hegemony, that we're trying to reach out to groups and to communities to actually, as Martin said, from exclusion to inclusion, to understand the processes of which people's lives can be validated. And that would include the young guys on the streets right now that I know who are selling cannabis because they want to make them, they want to make, they want to make life better for themselves and for their families. And I think we need to acknowledge that um, deeply in our, in our considerations of how we, how we move on. Um, I, I suppose the, the the one thing I would like to to point you to perhaps is the um, is is the very interesting publication by Will Hall, who you may know, and he he examines this idea by switching it around. So he talks about harm reduction guide to coming off psychiatric medication. So he's taking the learning from street drugs and applying it to psychiatry because the same rules apply. It's not easy to get off psychiatric medication. In fact, for some people, it's so, so hard. You know, you, you need, you, you know, it's to actually come off it straight away can be incredibly damaging to the person. You can get um, impacts which can replicate the psychosis, but they're not psychosis. They're kind of like a rebound effect as a consequence of, you know, if you've had your serotonin and your dopamine sort of suppressed, 
you know, and then suddenly that, that, that thing in your body disappears, it has a massive effect on people. So we, we need to acknowledge that if when people will say they want to come from medication or they want to come off drugs, they're asking the same thing. What is it that's going to replace this need that I have for this substance? Because without that replacement, maybe I will just go back to the things that were causing me the difficulties that me to take this substance in the first place. So we need to know that, you know, so for, for when we talk about medication withdrawal groups in that sense, we're not talking about a race to the bottom. We're trying to understand the nuanced relationship that you have with this substance and why it's important in your life. And if you remove it from your life, what's going to replace it? What do you need in your life to 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 to, you know, to help meet the needs that the medication currently um, is, is providing for you? So we don't want to say, you know, if you don't take psychiatric medication, um, you are the good guys. And if you do take psychiatric medication, you are the bad guys. That's not the agenda. It's about everybody making the best choices they can from, a, from, from having the, the, the information that they need to make the choice that they want to make. And this is my, my perspective, my, my comment. It's all about choice. It's about being able to have a real choice because you have the real information. I do not want to take antipsychotic medication, Mr. Psychiatrist, because I understand it will kill me in 20 years. Explain that to me. You know, so we, 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 so, and it might be that I'll say, yeah, okay, well, that's a bit like cancer medication and it also has negative effects. But I think for this purpose, I will take a little, you know, low dose, short term. The other thing I think for psychiatry and for other pushers, if that's what they are in quotation marks, when, if you're putting something, somebody on something, you also need to be planning to get them off it. And this is what psychiatry generally does not do. It's very good at getting you on it and up in it and changing it and changing it and up in it and changing it and up in it. But very rarely have they been part of the journey to bring down to end it. So this is a key thing I think that we need to do is work with our clinical colleagues to get this agenda into their heads and, and trying to sort of see how that might change things uh, in the way that we provide and support people in the future. So thank you very much. Grazie mille a te di questo bellissimo intervento che anche questo molto Thank you so much for this Thank you very much speech. for this intervention which we was ended really this first session where the clear point was the respect given to people so to give dignity back to people because each person as knowledge, they have the possibility to choose. So that's very much important. If we look at people in that way, maybe a lot of intervention could have success and could support people in a different way. If they are decided with a person who wants to decide what to do with his or life, Another aspect is the importance of the community to insert people in the community and how this context should be modified so to act in a different way. Now we will start the debate. I saw after Susanna Rocconi, Grazia Zuffa would like to talk and then Stefano Vecchio. So, grazie su fa first. Um, mi sentite? Allora, um, ci sono moltissimi stimoli, mi piacerebbe molto. Okay, stimoli. there are a lot of suggestions. I would like to say something on the last um, speeches, but unfortunately I have to make a choice. So, I'm choosing to say something on the um, speech by Susanna Ronconi. Uh, in terms of the potentials of the uh, harm reduction policies. I totally agree with the approach she had and all the potentials of the harm reduction uh, that it's not just a range of interventions of public health care but is it is also a new way of looking at consumption, drugs consumption. Having said that, 
I think that the last slides that Susanna was showing how to go beyond the harm reduction uh, must be taken very seriously for many reasons. First of all, in Italy, I was thinking of the International Conference of Harm Reduction, which took place in Florence 1995, a um, long time ago. But it was, you know, the, the launching of the um, harm reduction in, in Italy. So if it is true um, what Susanna states in her slides, that the harm reduction has an inherent criticism to the policies that are expressing um, dominating values um, which don't have healthcare at its center. It is also true that in the International Conference of 1995, harm reduction was presented as a strategy which was not in contrast with the dominating values as an almost an auxiliary strategy uh, to the dominating values. That, and I mean by that as a policy that didn't want to get into the criminal side of it, but also in terms of what was the approach of the services, uh, the exclusivity of the objective of abstinence and the priority of abstinence. Yesterday, I referred to the connections existing between the healthcare service uh, system and the criminal system. Uh, of course, that's very pressing because there are also the alternatives to detention and all the uh, discourse on the new, uh, what is called community justice system, the um, uh, people on parole, alternative measures to detention and so on, which are the actual control of the services, of the public service, a connection that I must frankly say it, a connection that does not worry the healthcare professionals uh, who uh, actually apply. The fact that the magistrate has decided doesn't mean that uh, healthcare professionals don't have to question it. And I don't think they do. I don't think they, the healthcare professionals question this. There is this political inheritance that has a certain weight, not only in Italy, now, secondly, as it is very important, in my opinion, to give uh, weight to the language, is the harm reduction policy. The accent has to be placed on drugs and harm. There's not a question of advantages or upsides and downsides. It is harm reduction, and we know that, as uh, the Georgi, uh, the criminologist, has explained, harm reduction falls within the uh, act actual um, uh, criminological paradigm. Uh, what manages the harm? by following parameters of effectiveness and efficacy, um, abandoning all hypotheses of social transformation and connection with the society. But this can be a less important uh, um, issue. How can we go further? I don't have a clear idea, but I have a couple of suggestions. We have tried and to do it, shifting the focus uh, from uh, addiction on the, onto control. 
on the capacity of uh, consumers to exert some control. The other thing we could do is reasoning more on the different control strategies and valorizing the approaches, for instance, E.G. Morford's approach, who wrote this wonderful book uh, that can be uh, interpreted differently, um, uh, talking about the uh, consumption uh, and the title is Excessive Appetites. It is an important text because the um, dilemma, the misunderstanding that's coming up is that we insist a lot and it's it's becoming common sense that most consumption of substances are uh, controlled consumptions. But uh, the black hole of intensive consumption still remains how they are viewed, how they're viewed by society, how they're viewed by the people. So we have to uh, speak more in depth about this because the controlled consumption is not always a moderate consumption. It's not always like that. There are a lot of variables uh, to be considered. And I think that uh, within the professional uh, field, this could be studied more in depth in order to find a different slogan, a different uh, password. Uh, I don't know whether Susanna, uh, what Susanna showed like uh, happiness and uh, health and happiness. Uh, I think it's a bit beyond uh, the uh, human experience. Uh, um, we need to talk about that. The human experience is um, made of health and, and unhealth, uh, of happiness and pain. But it certainly disconnects with the um, uh, typical solution. Now, this is just uh, these are just a few suggestions, and this is a, a field that needs to be studied more in depth. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention. That has enriched. Um, and now Stefano Vecchio is going to talk, but if you want to book um, your intervention, if you want to speak, um, as long as you do it um, uh, slowly so that the translators can intervene. So Stefano Vecchio is now going to, speech, to speak. I share what uh, uh, Grazia has uh, said. In fact, uh, there have been a lot of uh, um, subjects and hints that uh, uh, have come out. Uh, I hope that uh, this, this summer school can have a continuity um, and that maybe we can uh, uh, create a network with our speakers. Um, but I want to focus on um, one aspect. This is a summer school uh, where um, professionals are taking part, uh, third sector professionals, um, compared to other um, other um, uh, summer schools. Uh, and I'm saying this because I would like a given for taken for granted what Susanna said, uh, considering uh, that as a reference uh, framework. But I'm uh, asking this question initially. In Italy, Yesterday, I have uh, quoted Coleman when uh, he criticizes the empowerment uh, approach. Uh, you don't have to give in uh, power, uh, especially the people who, 
who experience all these problems, who are labeled as crazy, they should take the power back. So if someone gives the power back, uh, you know, he doesn't like that. So it, obviously, this is very complicated. Uh, in Italy, for instance, this type of experience are very limited, are very marginal. Uh, despite there are some attempts to self-organize, but we can say that in Italy, both in the field of drugs use and uh, mental health, uh, the, the, probably there's something more in the mental health field. Uh, when we organized the first network, um, Speak with the Voices, uh, we, try, we wanted to organize a meeting, but they said, no, we can't organize a meeting within the services. We have to organize it outside the services. So, so um, I think we have to understand why we cannot go forward. And I wonder what is the contribution that professionals can give when we think that the service system is a system that um, uh, supports stigma, uh, labeling, uh, is within the criminal system. But when we speak of this, we speak of uh, the official services. So there's more and more widespreading of a harm reduction practice that is within, um, that questions all the service uh, roles uh, and reducing the harm of criminalization. But we can't go any further very often. We prefer um, the healthcare uh, welfare system. I admired what Dr. Zamburo say, said earlier because I want to ask what can be the role, the role of harm reduction with all the limit that this uh, area has uh, within a law that um, criminalizes uh, the drugs users. So what, what is the risk that we have to run? Because we can't wait that there are the organizations, external organizations. And I think that Ugo was giving it, giving us uh, some um, suggestions. We can question our practices uh, and harm reduction is working on the models of use and consumption, trying to involve people. But uh, if it's only us who work, um, we have to understand what kind of spaces for negotiation we can uh, build, what spaces of uh, um, uh, realization. Uh, we don't have to be afraid of uh, being wrong. When Zimberg said, uh, think of competence, uh, increase competence, work with people and not um, in the place of people. This is an attitude on which we should uh, work. And then we have to understand the experience that uh, has, uh, has brought something that is similar to ENIC or to the self-help of uh, Paul Baker, the self-help group um, of Paul Baker. Then we can do something similar here. I want to remind you that when we were uh, giving a uh, responsibility to the drugs users and we all we were all involved, we created a context that 
we didn't really uh, forward. So maybe we should go back and do and work on that, elaborate on that, how to go beyond this and promote self-organization. Mm, otherwise, we are risking to um, speak a lot, but uh, we are going to uh, retire in our own areas. What Valentina and Grazia were saying, yes, there is a hard part of people who um, work on that, but they are marginalized, they're migrants. Uh, it's other models, other uses. Uh, so I think that the models of harm reduction going through the strategies of healthcare and even changing them, they can uh, open up new uh, scenarios. Thank you. Um, allora, uh, Stefano Vecchio. <coughs> Stefano sì. Vecchio. Yes, I totally agree with what you said. We have to avoid the mistake to keep the service out and we need to negotiate. I can talk just about my little experience I had with some friends and some colleagues. And I do refer to Oscar Oliveira, who was the Bolivian leader of the water war in Cochabamba. He always said, we need to find spaces to meet. And from that, we can start something. As Martin said, the, pro, the, the point is we can just stay among us and we all agree about any issue, but it's not useful to talk among us. So, when we opened the Vasaglia Coffee, we thought that it was important to meet in a different dimension, uh, in a pleasure dimension. And it was a circle inside which we could dance, we could uh, sing, we uh, talked about books. It was a way to create a community and also a way to discover that we could stay together, different people together, uh, not uh, all the same uh, kind of people uh, who meet and gather. This was a place where we could think about the global and the resistance and to create an alternative culture, which goes through the dimension of the pleasure, first of all. I'm thinking about Zapatismo, Something drug user says, uh, Zapatisti says, they cannot decide anything about us without us. That's why we really need to meet and to create a culture in those places. But those places must be attractive because people don't go to places where the idea is that over there, there is just suffering. So when we created the Basalia coffee with the idea to give work to some users for a working and social reinsertion, we used the cafe in order to create a community because the real problem is to create a community and the micro world must reflect the uh, biggest world. 
in the Café Bat Batalla, Batalla Coffee, there were people using drugs and people who didn't use drugs, people thinking in a way and people thinking in another way. The problem is to organize spaces where all different kinds of people can go. The, 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 the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, of the Desaparecido, uh, who really uh, were so strong to change the idea. And one of the words that they used is there is no world without pleasure. And the same can be said for the workers in this field, because most of the time when they start working, they feel in a way and then they start to feel in a different way. Then we should go to universities and to the places where people are trained. The summer school is a very great example of this. And I remember when we we had the permanent territorial school in the Bazzaglia school, and we talked about psycho drugs. There was a worker, there was an expert from experience, and a normal person. This was very much interesting because the Everything people said was interesting for us, even people who were not working in this field. So this was a, a real good experience, the experience of the Battaglia Coffee, the possibility to share ideas and knowledge. And that's it. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your answer. And before going into the other two questions, it could be interesting to ask to some of the speakers if they want to say something. Uh, Old Baker maybe was interested to say something. So we could start and maybe the other one could add something else. Paul Baker, please. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on this issue of um, creating alternative community groups. Um, and one of the things that we had to do is think about the spaces where we met. And if people are habituated to smoking cannabis, for instance, um, we, th we thought about outside venues. We're very sensitive to, 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 to increase people's understanding of their responsibilities to public spaces, whilst understanding that for some people to get to the meeting in the first place, they needed to have something in their body. So it's that kind of trying to understand and share senses of community and responsibility. The thing then is what we do in the groups, um, having brought people together to examine these issues, these complex issues to do with, for instance, only, we take a very holistic perspective. And this is where we were equally interested in talking about any issue in, in, in anybody's lives, rather than the focus being always on, on, on drugs or medication or whatever. Um, I think what we've learned is, is through doing that, we create a sense of, a Basalian sense of assembly. The idea that, that, that we're, we're talking about citizenship primarily, and we're talking about our lives. So we're also trying to induce and create activism energy within membership. So we talk about politics, we talk about the, the world and the, the, the kind of relationships we have. We talk about social determinants. We talk about this disease pathology model We've got to name it. It creates the problem in the individual, but we are struggling because of the social issues which press upon us, which create these things like debt or, or you know, toxic relationships. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we can point to. So what we're trying to do is, first of all, through com community and through, through conversation, um, we, 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 we sort of are part of a collective but, uh, and, and we inform and support that collective journey but that collective supports our individual journey. So there's, there's a parallel playoff. And we did this in Trieste with the Recovery House where we worked with young people under the age of 30 that had already been in the service for 10 years, taking psych, you know, taking medication and putting on lots of weight. And, you know, there were, their families were had lost hope that anything would change when the person entered the service. They hoped that their, per, that their family member, their adult son or daughter, would come back and be who they were. It never happened. They actually saw the person get worse. 
over 10 years. And this is, this, this is a reality based on basically you could see the person was heavily affected by the, by the psychoactive substances that were in their body. And the irony was, is that that would just not challenge, but if they ever then smoked something or took something else, it became, that became the problem. You are not complying. You're not accepting. You're not there in it. But this, this in a sense, creates a very sense of strong sense of civil war. I mean, uh, Eleanor Longdon is part of the enforcement of this psychic civil war. You're invited to actually attack your own sense of reality because this hegemonic idea that you are diseased and these are delusions and these are hallucinations and these are symptoms and you are ill kind of like eats away at your self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, I think the only other thing I would say is that we thought that's about trying to rebuild that and actually build your own sense of what's going on for you. For the, so the agenda when we created the recovery community in Trieste was around not pathological issues, but it was around meaning, identity, connection, purpose. Those are the kind of things that we, we, we talked about. They were the things that reconnected people to society and actually then made the, gave them the space to re-examine their own relationships with whatever that was going on for them. It's, it's you know, and, and somebody pointed out the thing about housing first. If you're not removing people from the toxic situation that they find themselves in, I don't know how you're going to move forward with relationship to their need to actually take medication to cope with that toxic situation. So in a sense, we have to deal with those toxic relationships and maybe the, the housing situations, what's going on in terms of people's peer groups. Uh, and I think that's the other thing about what we're talking about here. These peer spaces that we're talking about include workers who drop their power to be a peer. And anybody can be a peer. It's about your relationship to that group and how you understand. You are a participant, not the facilitator. Or even if you are a facilitator, you're a co-facilitator. It's always addressing the issues of democracy and deep democracy. Nothing about us without us. That means no staff meetings. That means to have community meetings instead. That's about not talking about the person, but talking with the person. You know, all those things come into play and it has deep consequences for the way that we work as professionals and about how we reorientate the way that we are from being interventionist to working alongside or even being led by that person and following. So it's about reconnecting. It's about addressing the power of symmetry and flattening it and even making it like that. So for me, it's a really big issue about the way we, we, we think, the way, the way the, even the culture of our services, and that will feed then into the practice. Thank you for Thank you your so much. intervention. Uh, Susanna, do you want to, want to go something? now? And if you want to talk about... I didn't want to take a more space, but briefly on what Grazia said, um, uh, harm reduction certainly started in the mesh uh, meshes of uh, um, prohibitionism and uh, um, the dominating uh, uh, thought uh, but i would like to say that uh, start, uh, harm reduction also starts in the awareness that we have to reduce the harm of drugs policies together and even before the uh, harm caused by the um, substances themselves. Uh, and that's what I wanted to say, uh, that um, uh, we had this awareness since the beginning, and certainly the harm reduction ex has been around for 35 years. What is important is to seize the uh, history and the evolution, which is not an internal history, but it's a history that relates to the changes of the consumption ways. And uh, uh, I think that the potentials were already there from the start, but uh, they have been mediated uh, by the context 
with the increase of uh, um, no so-called normalized consumptions, uh, not just the number of people, of drug users, uh, but also the models of consumption, uh, which are internal, uh, sustainable, um, and with the growing uh, of uh, the consumption culture, uh, the, there is a shift. So I think it is important to invest uh, in the poten in the proactive uh, potential um, for promoting this approach, and not just on the uh, on how to uh, contain uh, harm as uh, implicit in the harm reduction. I don't know whether I would use Karl Hart's slogan, health and happiness seems a bit excessive, but it certainly um, evokes uh, the shift that we have to uh, try and promote. Um, all the, the, the history over these 35 years, I think we have to use it to valorize it, uh, to value it. And it's not by chance, um, referring to uh, our Italian context, uh, to explain to our foreign guests, um, after so many years, we will have a national conference on drugs. We're going to um, have it. Um, despite our pressures, uh, harm reduction is not uh, an important uh, subject, but it's only um, within the prevention wider uh, scope. Um, and this is because the fact of medicalizing harm reduction, reducing it to two or three uh, interventions, which may be important, but uh, to uh, remove all the potentials uh, within the wider scope. Uh, because this conference uh, is not one where we can really talk about policy, policies. This is just to, uh, a detail I wanted to point out. Thank you, Susanna. Now let's go on to the questions. So Alessio Guidotti will take the floor and then Daniele so that uh, speakers can then reply. Alessio, can you please um, start your video? Okay, penso di, di esserci. Sì, le mie okay, I think I'm there. Um, my comments um, may be also some questions or some suggestions to think um, about what has been said so far, in particular what Stefano was saying on the uh, power and uh, surrender of power, um, the fact that that power is made uh, in the discourse between services and uh, users of the services is made of languages and spaces, which is very difficult um, to have um, where we have to surrender the power. So if you imagine uh, um, among the services uh, a right protection of rights, who will have to go a bit, um, who would have to step back is something very complex. Uh, um, but this is really based on languages and spaces because you, you can't imagine um, the discourse of, on power. Uh, power must not be surrendered, but must be taken. Um, but if you want to be real realistic, if you see all the service policies, imagining that consumers will uh, conquer the power, you know, you have to be uh, realistic. Uh, there's a lot of difficulties, one of which is the awareness the, of having the 
potential of having the possibility of using the language and in some debates acquiring these competences in a situation like the current one um, it is obvious we can say a lot of things a lot of nice things but if there is no methodology then uh, you know it should become a system uh, a method uh, so that the consumers uh, the service users uh, are recognized something you can call it surrender of power i don't know but uh, we the fact of imagining within the cert uh, the the service uh, in italy um, that takes a lot of space i don't think this could happen so yes there must be a rejection of power uh, from the services so this should become a method and another point is how reduction policies should be how can we solve the enormous conflict there is how harm reduction can take uh, on board uh, uh, the policies because we have been rejected uh, very elegantly a video on cannabis a five minutes video clip which was uh, uh, pointing out the fact that um, cannabis is prohibited because this was a service paid by uh, the regional government of a region that I won't mention. So how can we speak about harm reduction services because they don't receive funds by uh, private foundations, uh, they're not self-funded. How can harm reduction uh, solve these issues in a space where consumers should have a, a voice? If we recognize that the, uh, that the harm, the damages uh, of uh, war on drugs uh, have, um, how can we solve it? How can we solve it? This, this contradiction, the surrender of power and all the rest, how much courage do we need? Uh, so they rejected our video. Uh, we managed to um, produce a flyer uh, saying uh, what um, sense does it make to um, punish uh, drugs users uh, and that's all we did and one last point uh, Hugo, uh, with reference to what Hugo said on the school uh, issue uh, that's really important uh, the students from university that is out of uh, a number of other discourses uh, the students should be involved uh, we are probably sitting there we preach and convert we speak a lot among ourselves uh, we speak uh, uh, between ourselves but not to others one more word on the conference but i will give up uh, my um, comment uh, uh, because i don't want to be politically incorrect so i want a comment on the conference thank you thank you alessio for all these ref important reflections i would ask Andrea to uh, come in and then I would leave space to the speakers again to respond. Good morning. I'm speaking here as uh, as ex-cannabis uh, consumer, light uh, drugs consumer. 
And as a user, um, who is experiencing um, psychiatric services um, uh, as a user. Currently, I am in a group of housing, so it is true that it's possible to develop uh, uh, some knowledge um, and that we have to aim at the well being and the welfare and within the national and uh, supranational systems. So first, harm reduction can uh, take place within a scientific approach uh, by giving information uh, to adolescents, uh, uh, to students, uh, uh, starting on uh, drugs, uh, starting from drugs and expert users, if you agree. Uh, secondly, uh, um, as far as my experience goes, first in the family and then in uh, in the community. When I was still in the family, I was volunteering in a process of uh, um, experienced life uh, where there was an exchange between myself and migrants. I I started to learn how to communicate with different languages, with uh, people um, from a different cultural background, with a quite difficult approach, um, especially in the need of uh, soft drugs. Uh, I wanted to highlight the fact that there was this exchange, this cultural exchange, uh, linguistic mediation, and under this culture, which is, which is not a subculture, I am actually enhancing the value of this culture. Uh, there was an exchange with what we used to call joints. Um, there was the problem that um, compared with the um, criminal approach of uh, uh, um, uh, law enforcement uh, um, uh, institutions, um, you know, the, you should consider being available to um, uh, people who are in need uh, of um, a different types, uh, type of approach. This is uh, something very, very personal, of course. I continue um, taking um, uh, drugs, but the dominating thought, the dominant thought, um, unfortunately, we're uh, having signs of going back to the past, but we have to oppose this trend of going back. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for having shared your experience. Um, do the speaker want to reply to these comments? Well, uh, maybe I can start now um, and have some some comments uh, on uh, on the idea of the, that uh, it's easy to take power. I I think that. Uh, it's uh, really hard for for people that are totally disenfranchised, that are disorganized at that moment, that live on the streets, to go and tell the doctor, oh, "Listen, I, I need some methadone, and, and uh, now I want to change to buprenorphine because I'm going to travel." And you, you, it's not expected uh, that the, the the user participates in this. Uh, uh, clinical development. So uh, uh, I, I think there's there's a need for services to reflect on user commissions or on some 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 way of uh, investing, really investing. So it must it, it must be budgeted and it must be debated on 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 the big conferences. Uh, so it's a scandal that harm reduction is not. Uh, Included in the in the, the area of the care for users, 
I, I heard a lot the idea of building community, and I, 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 it strikes me like it, it, it's this idea that I, I, I feel can be uh, opening uh, some some lines. So, uh, opening dialogues between the, the users and services, building these bridges, being the bridges. And, and uh, trying to, I, I also uh, read the importance of words, so trying to inter include uh, different words that are not so um, con con connoted to, to negative aspects. Uh, uh, I think that, that also part, in part, our arm reduction began among, among users and, and Probably among all oppressed uh, publics, because we 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 saw in the eighties our friends dying, and, and uh, we saw that if we had a, a backpack full of syringes and people didn't share, they would survive. So this is a, a very pragmatic and practical, uh, and and almost natural being a peer, being another human, uh, uh, creating a safe space, and uh, and so. This kind of uh, uh, kind of overwhelming capitalism and deeper consumerism that uh, you know makes uh, a lot of waste and also a lot of human waste because there's no job for everyone. There's no solutions. It's a kind of vicious circle, and this uh, this uh, uh, disenfranchised people. Uh, you know, there's the, there's the need for better literacy on health and rights, so that uh, when we talk about empower people, this has a, a, a connection to reality, and it's not just uh, words. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I also wanted to say that there was there there is some some uh, a lot of uh, uh, path already done, and the European strategy says the. Uh, the the promotion of peer work is uh, useful in our reduction, so it's step-by-step, uh, step, but I think some improvement can, can be found. Um, and just some comments also on uh, other uh, drugs and licit drugs and the idea of self-medicalization. And this, you know, this happened till the 19th century. You know, then there was a fight between pharmaceutics and, and, and doctors. Who, who is the, the owner of the of the dealing? You know, uh, but for the user, I, I think we should be informed of all the options possible. And if I need methadone, and on top of that, I need some benzo, bromazepam, lorazepam, whatever, I, I I should be given that. I need I need to be informed about myself, my body. How can how, how do I react to these different substances? And in, it's a unique alchemy that you have to find for each person on on, on each moment. So, um, yeah. Also, some kind of activism. I, I think it became chronic. HIV became became not a deadly disease. Became a chronic disease. And with this, lots of uh, organizations, NGOs, services that became, became also entangled on a, a chronic you know, dependence on the state or on institutions to be uh, uh, invested on. Um, so so would, would see very, very uh, would take out this idea of uh, building community, uh, building dialogues and uh, because I, I guess it's on that uh, on that uh, uh, interchange of uh, worlds and realities that uh, something you know more more uh, useful and adequate can be can be built. I, I guess. Grazie mille dell'intervento. Vedo anche sulla chat in linea. Thank you so much. I see in the chat most people are saying it's very much needed that you create uh, meeting spaces. We are reaching the end. I don't know if someone else wants to say something or maybe there is time for one last question. Maybe. 
Valentina Mancuso wants to talk. Mi sentite? Sì, ora ti Can sentiamo. Can me? Yes. Eh, no, niente, volevo fare anche una piccola riflessione, nel senso che in realtà da aggiungere... I just want to say that I totally agree with everything that was said until now. The fact that in Italy we have a reality like a chemical sister, Ital Hood, and they are recognized not at institutional level, but we recently received an invitation to take part in the national conference. But at social level, we are well known. So this is very much important because this allows people not just to be, to be seen, but also recognized in the entire society. And as I said before, an active participation is needed so to allow services to think about the real needs of people and to structure functional responses to their needs. Before we spoke about power, as Baker said, the power of language is one of the most important tools we have. Also in order to struggle at political level, but if we consumers are always defined as toxic people and we ourselves, we define ourselves as toxic people, we cannot be seen as we real as we really are. Uh, if there is a stigma and we we ourselves see ourselves as uh, people who can accept uh, this stigma, we are not going to change the situation. So peer health is very much needed, as I said before during my speech. And also I totally agree about the power of language. And also when we talked about power, I was also thinking about the issue of pleasure we talked about before with chemical sisters, the power to reivindicate the possibility to get pleasure, to have pleasure. This is a right that was always hidden by society, especially for women, as we know. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your ideas and also uh, about talking about chemical scissors, a reality I recently knew, which is a very important reality we have in Italy. If there are no other questions, maybe we can end our conference. Let me have a look in the chat. I think that's all. Okay, so I thank all the speakers and all the participants to the conference for what they said. It was really enriching, everything you said. So it was a real pleasure listening to you and to stay here in this special conference with you. I don't know if we must say something for the afternoon, but we are going to meet at three o'clock for the new session at three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, just a few words quickly. Okay, we also want to thank you and the link you have will be the same for the afternoon session, but the coordinators of the room, maybe we should uh, get before.